Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Tandy Writes. Today we're going to be talking about some of my favourite books that I've read this year so far. So we are, well at the time of recording this, it is April 29th, so we have done the first third of the year. I have read 52 books of my original reading goal of 52 books, which would have worked out to be one a week, but I've had somehow a lot of free time. So my reading goal has now gone up to 100 books. <laughs> There are a select few that I really want to talk about. Some of these I've already made video reviews for and blog reviews and you can find them on this channel and on my blog where the link is in the description but some of them I haven't got around to that yet so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and why I liked it. So let's begin. So the first best book of the year for me was um, House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. Oh she's, she's a little shiny. Um, this book is a kind of horror-influenced retelling of the Twelve Dancing Princesses and it features ghosts and curses and at the time of reading it, most important to me, was a lighthouse. <laughs> I was going through a big lighthouse, lighthouse core phase and the fact that this book had a lighthouse in the setting that was actually used and relevant to the plot later on was very special to me. So things that I really loved about this book I think number one, the setting is set on like an, it's a manor on an island, it's very barren, it's very creepy and spooky, even without the horror influences. But it's a very beautifully written setting and there's a lot of characters, they are the 12 dancing princesses, but every character feels unique and it stands out to me and I love so many of them. And I love the mystery element to it and the horror influences works so well with this plot especially the 12 dancing princesses sneaking out to the balls each night there's a lot of things that happen there that i can't give spoilers to but just beautiful storytelling so the next best book i read this year was um teeth by hannah moskovitz and i am still so in love with this book and so many things about this book it's a very brutal and bloody story of a human boy befriending a fish boy after he moves to this barren island where there's magical fish that can cure any illness. So the main character's little brother is suffering from cystic fibrosis so he has to eat these magical fish to keep him going until he can get a land, uh, get a land transplant, until he can get a lung transplant. And the main character is just this very lonely boy, he's moved to this island with no other people his own age except from this fish boy who's very bad at, I say fish boy not mermaid because he's literally top half human and bottom half fish so he can't breathe in the water and he can't swim very well. And this, it was so close to being a love story and in some ways it was, it's a platonic love story and it's, it's just, I don't have the words for how much I love this book and how much it still hurts just to think about it. And I so badly want there to be a film adaptation of this book and if not, I will make it myself one day. I'm a film student, I can do it. <laughs> so yeah, this book also has a very barren island setting. It reminds me a lot of the location near where I grew up. I don't live on an island, I live in southwest England, but it's a lot of very cold, windy, desolate beaches. The two characters are both very messy, broken characters, and they spend this entire book just trying a way to be friends. <laughs> So it is this platonic love story and just the ending hurts so much. It, it truly broke me. So a special mention to the list is this other book by Hannah Moskovitz called Salt. It's a story about four siblings who are sea monster hunters who are just trying to find out if their parents are dead or alive after they went missing on a hunt many years ago. The big things about this book are the family themes. They're kind of like pirate, boat, sea monster influences and also the main character, our narrator, our main character there is having a bit of an identity crisis because he spent his entire life at sea and he's trying to find out if, like, if this is the life he really wants. So out of the two Hannah Moskovitz, Hannah Moskovitz, out of the two Hannah Moskovitz books, Teeth won out in this round but I wanted to give this this very special mention, it's also a very like little short book and this also means a lot to me. Not as much as Teeth but it does mean a lot. The next book on this list is something that I wasn't expecting to love so much. This book here is Some Kind of Happiness by Claire, should I say Legrand? Legrand. Legrand. But yeah, it's this book here. This was, I saw it on one of my friend's Goodreads shelves for her favourite books of all time. 
and this little like foresty cover stuck out to me because I was going through a forest phase at this time. And I picked this up and I thought, yeah, maybe I like the aesthetics of it. Maybe it might not be for me. But oh, it snuck onto this list. <laughs> it owns a lot on my heart. This book is about a girl, she's maybe like 11, 12, it's a, it's a middle grade book. But it's about this young girl who is depressed but hasn't been diagnosed with that yet until the end of the book. So she has these like blue days and to cope with this sadness she retreats into this very magical Everwood which is a forest kingdom that exists in the pages of her notebook. And throughout the book um, she's been sent off to her grandparents' house to live with her cousins for a summer while her parents try and work out a divorce. So this book is about her and her cousins just being kids and exploring this fictional world and it alternates with real world chapters and actual chapters of this fictional story which I love so much. And they're also, while out tend to be characters, they're trying to uncover some real family mysteries which involves them teaming up with some like dodgy neighbours and their kids nearby who also become part of the story and it's just it's a very heartwarming but also heartbreaking read. And as I said, I wasn't expecting this book to make the best books of the year so far for me list. But as, well, I'm depressed currently, but as a former sad blue days child who spent a lot of time taking refuge in notebook pages and fictional worlds, this book truly stood out to me for the fact that it just read me to film. <laughs> I was going to include another book by Claire on this list. I recently read um, Sawkill Girls, which was a very, very good book. But recently I've started to prioritise books by um, how much I like them rather than how good they are as books. So my sentimental value and how much they hit my niche interests rather than the actual quality of the book. So some kind of happiness made the list because the emotional value. Sawkill Girls didn't quite make it because although it was very very good, if I was ranking books by quality that would be one of my top books of the year. There's something just missing for me, it's missing like a little personal spark. So Sawkill Girls is an honourable mention, I don't have a copy of it here, but very very good. Next book on this list I was expecting to love very much. I got this book in an old crate box for Greek mythology. And you can't quite see, but my Percy Jackson shrine is here. Song of Achilles is somewhere on this shelf behind me. So I saw they were doing a Greek themed box and I knew I just had to have it. So this book is Law by Alexandra Bracken. And this is a book I knew would have been my favorite straight up. So this book is most often described as Greek mythology meets the Hunger Games. And that is a very good way of describing it. So as punishment for rebelling against Zeus, nine gods are forced to walk the earth as mortals and be hunted down by descendants of ancient bloodlines. And things that stood out to me about this book is that it's, well, it's set in the modern time, so it has a, a lot of time spent weaving in thousands of years of history about this like punishment event and in the modern times. There's <laughs> a lot of time, like very, very good weaving of past and present and also far past and a nearer past of the main character's backstory. I know a lot of people don't like Alexandra Brecken's writing. I know people had a tough time with Passenger. It seemed to be like a very you either love it or hate it book but I, I loved this book and the other standouts for me were the main female character it's a very strong female character and I know the people don't seem to care about that as much as they used to but she has this wonderful balance of vulnerability from being a broken child and how she is now who is ready to hunt down the god for revenge. And there are these like, very beautiful feminist scenes that are feminist in a way that isn't, um, how do I say it, it's not very in your face and it's not feminist in a, like, a men hating way. It's, there's a very com there's a very simple conversation that stands out to me in this book of our main character Law and Athena discussing how women throughout Greek history tend to be erased from the narrative or if they are there their story tend to be twisted from what really happened. And the other thing that stands out to me in this book was like there's a bit of a found family trope going on. You have Law, you have her childhood best friend who's come back from the assumed dead 
there's a current best friend who knows nothing about this like magical Greek world and there's just a it's this very lovely combination of Greek gods people who know about the Greek gods and then people who don't have a clue just all mingle together and I do like how Alexander Bracken did include that like normal character just just into the mix the next book that made this list I knew I would like because I spent many pages just throughout many pages I spent a long time browsing the Owl Crate um, special edition books and I picked out this one because something about it just stood out to me this book here let's check who's by it's The Bone Houses by Emily Lloyd-Jones so a tough grave digger girl and a very soft map maker boy with chronic pain are going on an adventure through both mountains and folklore to try and face the curse of these risen corpses and also long hidden truths about themselves. I love Matt Make Matt Make a Boy with all my heart, not just because he has chronic pain, but I have chronic pain, so I loved that this was in the book and it didn't just suddenly get cured by the end. I love this soft boy character who's got this very tough girl to defend him. And she spends the first part of the book defending her family because there's these things called bone houses which are corpses that haven't quite stayed dead and they have risen and they are attacking the village so the main girl character is her big traits are loyalty and just specifically to her family she spends a lot of time fighting for her family and i love that because she's only got her siblings left um, her parents are dead, she's going off on this adventure to try and find out if her dad is actually dead or just presumed dead. And she's just so fiercely loyal to them when it would be so much easier not to be sometimes. And she's also very loyal to this map maker boy who has just come out of nowhere and will pay her whatever she wants so he can go make maps in the mountains and become very rich and he's also looking for his long lost family. And this book, I think I gave it four stars because it is very, very good. And it hits my niche interests of dead things and also folklore. I think it's very Welsh inspired folklore, which I haven't read about in books before. So this was very lovely to me, but I didn't give it a full five stars because there was just something missing about it again. The plot is very focused on this one singular storyline. And when it's been dual narrated by two characters who are on this adventure together, you, it's very like stuck on this one route. And I would have liked more, but I can't actually tell what that more is. Like, what do I want from this? I wanted something, but what was it? But overall, this again is heartwarming and heartbreaking in a very weird way. And also, I love I love folklore. <laughs> So the final book I want to talk about, I don't have a physical copy of it yet, but this is House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland, I believe. I think it's the same author who wrote this. I think it's her. And as someone who was only like, meh, about that book, at the time I read it, it was in like the peak John Green Tumblr era. So I liked it at the time, but looking back, I saw the film of it the other day and it, it was not good. And I can't tell if that's because the source material wasn't great or if just Lily Reinhart is a questionable actress. So when I picked up House of Hollow, I loved the description but I was having some doubts because um, the author's past works. But I f fell in love with this book. This had so many things that I loved. And it's very hard to describe what this book's about without giving away too much plot. So, there are three Hollow Sisters. The oldest one's called Grey, the youngest one's called Iris, the middle one I can't remember the name of, but she seems to be the least important sister in this plot. The eldest one goes missing and she leaves behind this very bizarre trail of breadcrumbs to give hints of where she's gone. And she's hinting that it's got something to do with this thing that happened when the three sisters were children. Like they disappeared for a month and came back, none of them have any remember any memory of what happened besides having that little scar on their throat. So her older sister's gone missing and dropped some breadcrumbs saying that it's to do with this thing but as no one knows what this thing is they're just investigating. And then strange things start happening to the youngest sister and the two younger sisters decide together 
that they need to solve this mystery and they need to find out what happened to them as children. The actual mystery of they find the lost sister, this could be a spoiler, but they find the lost sister in the first half of the book. The second half is dealing with what happened to them as children. And throughout the book it's very heavily hinted about what happened, but it's very easy to shrug off and say like, yeah, that's, that's just a theory. So even though I kind of had a suspicion of what the big reveal was, I was s still shocked. And I love that. And also this book is, I think it is marked as, as a horror, a very aesthetic, flowery, butter not butterflies, maybe moths horned creatures with like antlers in the woods. It's a very aesthetic horror and there are a lot of moments of that that kind of didn't really keep me up at night but there's these little images that just kept getting stuck in my head and I was like oh god oh no. So th th there were some horror elements that were very very good and that's the same as Saw Kill Girls. It has some horror elements that did make you feel a little bit scared and I love when a book can do that. The only other book that's kind of done that good for me was surprisingly this one. And I don't remember what this book's about anymore. So those are the six books plus two honourable mentions that I've read this year. That are the best books that I read this year so far. In the first third of this year. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It's going to be very long and rambly and probably not very good. <laughs> but this is mostly from my records now. So I hope you enjoyed this video in the comments below. Please let me know what one of your favourite books of the year so far is and if you've read any of these books and also recommendations if you want anything similar. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Bye.